Yeah, I'll be talking about Pigweed and Bazel for embedded development. You all know what Bazel is, but let me quickly talk about Pigweed and embedded development. So different people define embedded development differently. For the purposes of this talk, by embedded development, I mean programming that's focused on low power chips that are going to be used in some standalone devices. So these chips will sometimes be um, the main chip and a relatively small device like headphones or satellites or toys or dishwashers. So small, small in terms of compute, not small in terms of physical footprint. Or they might be auxiliary chips and larger devices, um, things like smartwatches or cars, et cetera. Um, these chips typically are not running a full-featured OS like Linux or Android, but they might be running an RTOS. So you might be having some sort of OS abstraction there, but it's not the one that you're familiar with uh, from uh, software development on a host machine like Mac or Windows. Um, or they might be running bare metal, so there might be no OS at all, and your code is just running directly on the chip. Um, one of the most important things about embedded development is that there is a very large variety of chip architectures. So it's not just x86 um, or um, ARM64. Uh, there's zillions upon zillions of chip architectures. And in fact, frequently the same product will contain multiple chips which have different architectures. And then the last important feature of embedded development from the point of view of someone who is thinking about the build system for it is that uh, Embedded development is mostly C and C++, and historically many embedded developers would think of themselves mostly as people who write C or C++, but this was never entirely true, and gradually it's becoming less and less true over time. So first, it's becoming less and less true because new languages, especially memory-safe languages like Rust, are making their way into embedded products. But it's also not true because embedded development has always involved developing a suite of tools that surround the firmware. So the firmware might be written in C or C++, but then you need to have tools for flashing this firmware. You have tools for running uh, factory tests on the, on the devices that have been built. You have tools for running diagnostics on the device. And all of these tools are actually developed typically by the same teams who are developing the firmware. Um, and they're part of the same code base. Um, and they're not going to be written in C or C++. They're usually written in Python. Sometimes they're written in, in web languages. So in fact, firmware development is this multi-language uh, undertaking. All right, so that's embedded development. And what about Pigweed? Pigweed launched in 2020 as an open source offering uh, originally produced by Google for um, uh, accelerating embedded development. So Pigweed is a collection of libraries, a collection of developer tools, and uh, a way of thinking about how to make embedded applications. Uh, Pigweed has been shipping in Google products for some time, indeed since before its uh, public launch. Um, it's in Google phones, tablets, displays, buds. Um, and you can give it for, take it for a spin today. Um, I particularly recommend the Sense uh, concept product that uses the Raspberry Pi Pico. And I'll have a little bit more to, to tell about uh, it later. All right, all right. So uh, that's embedded development and pigweed, but what does this talk about anyway? Um, what I'd like to tell you about are the three eras of embedded development with Bazel. Um, these three eras, as I think of them, started with the manual era, which was full of duplicative toil then went through the transitional era where uh, much more powerful APIs such as platforms and tool chains and transitions became available to us, all the way to the modern era in which after using these uh, powerful APIs for a while and figuring out what are good patterns for employing them, we came up with streamlined ways of uh, doing embedded builds. All right, so these are the three eras. Let's start with the manual era. In the bad old days of the manual era, projects would typically, embedded projects would typically write their own custom C++ compilation rules. Uh, they wouldn't use native CC library, CC binary. They would need special ways to build their firmware, so they would write their own special rules. Um, these special rules would typically uh, involve macros that stamp out separate per architecture library and binary targets. So as I told you, as a key feature of embedded development is that uh, there, are lots of there are lots of architectures, often within the same product, and that means that you want to build the same libraries and the same binaries uh, for many different target platforms. And so the way teams traditionally dealt with this is that they said, well, if I'm going to be building the software for three different platforms, let me just stamp out three targets uh, within my build file, and I'll have a little helper macro that stamps them out automatically. Um, so um, uh, this worked, but it had some problems, as you might imagine. The problem is that once every project uses a different set of rules of macros that they uh, came up with themselves, it becomes very difficult to 
produce build files for shared libraries. It's a real headache for whoever's trying to maintain these shared libraries. And in fact, on the right here, you have what, what might look like a, a contrived example, but is actually a slightly obfuscated instance of an actual build file from this manual era. So we would have project A. They came along and said, well, we're using CMSYS. Let us write some build files for CMSYS. They had their own custom uh, rule. Um, and they said, ah, OK, here's project A embedded library for this particular CMSYS library. Um, here are some architectures that we support, the project A embedded architectures, and we're done. And then project B comes along and says, ah, we have our own custom uh, rules for compiling firmware for our custom targets. Well, let's add another library target uh, to this build file. And then a few more projects do this. Uh, so this is not great, right? Um, another thing that's not great, and that's a hidden a little bit here under the surface, is that your compiler configuration is now split between two places. There's the actual toolchain configuration, but then there's the implementation of all these custom rules, uh, which uh, might also add features of the compiler configuration. All right, so that was the manual era, and then uh, Fortunately, we have been liberated from it. And in the transition era, we came up with better ways of uh, building embedded software with Bazel, um, using things like um, uh, transitions at the binary rule level. So the idea is now, like high-level idea is, we're not going to have all of these custom project-specific library targets. We're just going to use vanilla CC library. But if we're only using vanilla CC library, then where do we inject like, special information about uh, uh, our project-specific architectures or compiler flags? Well. Let's do this at the very top. Let's do it at the level of the binary rule. So we'll still have custom binary rules, but we're not going to have custom library rules anymore. And then let's also use label flags for flexible configuration of our dependencies. All right. So this is the like, general overview of the transition era, but it's a little abstract. So I'd like to talk about a concrete example, really concrete. Um, here's a quadruped robot. This is one of the Barkour robots that was developed by Google DeepMind. This robot is actually open source, so both its design assets, its CAD files, et cetera, as well as its software, the, the firmware and other associated code are available on GitHub. Um, and what I'd specifically like to talk about is the um, uh, firmware for this robot's motor controller, which is an example of an embedded project from this transition era. So um, the motor and the motor controller are living in the shoulder of this robot. So if you see, if you look at this robot, you can see that it's moving. It's moving. It's one of its paws, and uh, and in its shoulder there's this like uh, uh, cylindrical part. Okay, so let's take a closer look at the cylindrical part. Deep inside the cylindrical part is the motor controller. So let's talk about the motor controller. So this motor controller is a custom printed circuit board uh, that's going to be um, driving current through the motor in order to get the robot to move its paw. Um, and uh, in the very heart of this motor controller is this little chip here. So it's a custom PCB. There's a bunch of electronics on there. But uh, as a software engineer, I'm most interested in the part of it that has custom software. And that part is the little one that you find there inside that box. Uh, that's an STM32H755 dual core microcontroller. So the important thing about it is that, well, firstly, yeah, it's a programmable microcontroller. And then secondly, it actually has two cores inside of it. So even though it's just a single IC, it's a single physical part, inside of it are two logical cores. And these two logical cores are actually different. Um, so they're similar in that they're both going to need uh, some shared features. You're going to need to have some sort of logging facilities for each of these cores. You're going to need to have RPCs. You're going to need to have work queue threads. So there's a lot of shared dependencies between these cores. But there are actually important differences. When you compile software for these cores, you need to pass different compilation flags. Um, these cores, you both the the, uh, the the Barkour motor controller is based on FreeRTOS, which is a uh, real-time operating system. But you need different FreeRTOS ports and different FreeRTOS configurations for each of the cores. So when you think about building software for this uh, product, there are actually three platforms that you have to think about. There's, of course, the host platform, Linux or Mac, Mac OS, in which you're developing. But then there are two different hardware platforms. There's the Cortex-M4 and there's the Cortex-M7. All right. Um, so what are some of the like, developer user journeys that uh, we'd like to enable for, uh, for the uh, uh, Barkour motor controller work, uh, workflow? So um, a central one is flashing. You know, you're working on your software. You're, writing, you're making some change to the firmware. And then when all is said and done, you want to flash the firmware onto the device. So you want to be able to transfer the firmware from your uh, uh, laptop or workstation onto the motor controller, which is connected to your, to your uh, developer uh, machine through a JTAG cable. 
All right. So ideally, you can do this through one basal invocation, and indeed, this is possible, right? So um, in this project, you can just uh, make this basal run invocation uh, uh, to, to some helper script, pass it the flash uh, uh, command line argument, and this is going to uh, build and flash uh, the software. And this is pretty cool because it's actually a free platform build. So Bazel is going to know that, oh, this uh, flash script, it's a, it's a Python helper script that's going to run on the workstation, but it has a dependency on the firmware. And the firmware is for the M4 platform and for the M7 platform. And it's going to build or, as required, rebuild those pieces of the software necessary before uh, it then executes the flasher and flashes it onto the, uh, onto the hardware. All right, so the M4 binary is just a vanilla CC binary, and the Python flasher is just a vanilla Py binary. So how does this work? Like, we have to tell Bazel that they need to be built for different platforms. How do we express this? And in this project, we express this through a transition. Um, um, so the secret sauce to it is that, uh, yeah, there's this uh, uh, M4 binary custom rule, which consumes a CC binary, and then uh, tells the CC binary that it needs to be built for a different platform. All right, all right. Um, uh, so that's pretty neat. Um, and that's where all of the like, knowledge of the target platform in this project resides. Uh, and then below that, we have a whole bunch of CC libraries for specific pieces of functionality that are need to be implemented inside the model controller. But all of that is expressed using vanilla Bazel primitives. So the libraries are all going to be CC library. If we need to have some low-level details which differ, uh, depending on which uh, architecture you're targeting, we'll put this at the very bottom here uh, inside some selects. So, the neat thing about taking this approach is that although we're developing code that ultimately in production is going to be deployed on the Cortex-M, you can build the libraries and their unit tests targeting the host platform. So even if you don't happen to have the piece of hardware on hand connected to your workstation, you can build and run all of the unit tests and convince yourself, at least to some extent, that the code is correct. So the reason this is cool, of course, is that then you can do this in CI as well. So you can have your uh, continuous integration be running these unit tests and verifying that they still pass, even without having a piece of hardware in the data center connected to the machines running the tests. All right. Um, and then there's one last piece uh, of the like, software architecture of uh, the Barkour model controller I want to talk about, which is um, configuring external, external dependencies through label flag, which is like, my favorite piece of Bazel that is the least appreciated. Um, uh, so uh, you'll remember from the previous slide, or maybe you won't remember, so I'll, I'll go back to it to show you again, uh, that in CC libraries that we just define within the repo, we can use these select statements to decide that, oh, we need a different source file here depending on whether we're building for the Cortex M chip or whether we're just building for the host. Um, but what if you have examples on some external, um, what if you have dependencies on some external repositories that require similar configuration? So for example, uh, the Barkour model controller depends on FreeRTOS, which is this RTOS library. Um, and uh, FreeRTOS requires a configuration file. Uh, there's, there's this uh, file that needs to be called freeRTOSconfig.h, um, and you have to provide it to FreeRTOS. And actually, within this project, we have to provide it twice, right? We have to provide a different freeRTOSconfig.h file uh, for the M4 uh, core and for the M7 core. Um, uh, so how are we going to do this? One approach we could have taken is that, oh, we'll just copy, we'll just vendor FreeRTOS, right? We'll, we'll just copy it into the project source tree, and we'll have a select, and that's how it's going to work. But there's another approach, which is pretty exciting, which is just put a label flag within FreeRTOS. So you tell FreeRTOS, FreeRTOS is some library, um, and then it has a dependency on this thing called the free artist config. Um, and uh, uh, you're going to make this dependency be a label flag. And by default, this label flag is something that's not compatible with any platform. So you're saying, no, no, please, please do specify a free artist config explicitly. Um, and then um, at the build time, depending on the target platform, you set this label flag to different values. So the nice thing about this approach is that this build file can be checked into upstream FreeRTOS directly. So anyone who uses FreeRTOS can use exactly the same build file because no, there's no like select where on the left-hand side of the select knowledge of your specific project has somehow been uh, injected into. No, no, this is perfectly generic. Anyone who uses FreeRTOS can use this. They just, they just need to set the label flag to different values. All right. OK, but you need to set the label flag to different values, so how do you do that? Well, takes, that takes us back to the transition bit. So as I told you, this is the transition that you saw before, the one that we use to build a CC binary specifically for the M4. Uh, and one of the things it does is that it set this, sets this FreeRTOS config flag. And so it sets the FreeRTOS config flag to a value that's specific to uh, the M4. All right. 
All right. So um, this, is, this was this example project from the uh, 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 transitional era. And to recap it, uh, you know, wh what are we doing here at the high level? Uh, we've tried to use vanilla platform agnostic CC library for libraries. This meant that we had to put all of the pieces of build configuration somewhere else. And where did we put them? We put them uh, at the binary rule level encoded in these transitions. And then we also wanted to configure some external repositories. So there are places where our select was not flexible enough for what we wanted to do. And so we used uh, label flags for configuration across repo boundaries. All right. Uh, so, so that was the transition era. Um, and uh, we'll begin the modern era with a question. And the question is, you know, if all we are trying to do is switching between platforms and some associated build bundles of label flags, uh, can we do something simpler than a transition? So transitions are very powerful. They're very expressive. But they're also a little, a little confusing. They're like very intimidating to people who are new to Bazel. Um, and uh, uh, if you could get away without them, that would be great. And it seems like what we're doing here requires something much weaker than a transition. So can we do it? Um, and the answer is, uh, in Bazel 8, yes, we can. And the mechanism through which we can do so are this, these so-called platform-based flags. All right. So uh, what are platform-based flags? So you'll recall this is like the same transition that we've seen a couple times uh, in this talk already. Uh, it's the M4 transition that takes a, consumes a CC binary and tells Bazel, oh, build the CC binary, please, but set the platform to, to the M4 platform and also set the free Artos config appropriately, and maybe there's more label flags. Um, in Bazel 8, uh, we can do something like this. We can say mm, the platform is going to include uh, some flags, like the free Artos config flag. And then there's going to be, no longer is there a custom rule. There's no custom rule anymore. Instead, there's this generic uh, platform data rule from rules platform um, where we specify, again, a target, which is a CC binary, and we specify the platform that this target should be built for. So we've replaced the custom transition with, this, uh, with flags that are now part of the platform definition and uh, with a generic platform data rule that tells Bazel to, to build a binary for a particular platform. All right. So this is the like, modern era mechanism. Uh, let's talk about the modern era example. Uh, one example project from this modern era that like, uh, shows how these APIs are being used is uh, Pigweed Sense. Um, Sense is a demo consumer electronics product concept that Pigweed developed uh, as part of the Raspberry Pi Pico launch this summer. Uh, so Raspberry Pi has launched a new microcontroller, the RP2340, 2350, um, and also a new board, the Pico 2, um, that's uh, shown here in this image that, that is like built around this microcontroller. And, uh, the, and uh, Pigweed Sense is a, is a toy product built uh, for the Raspberry Pi Pico 2. Um, yeah. All right, so uh, I thought that this uh, giving a talk to 200 people is definitely not a stressful enough way to spend an afternoon, so I also decided that I'm going to do a live demo. Uh, and uh, so I have a piece of electronics here. This is actually the Raspberry Pi Pico right Oh, sorry, this is the Raspberry Pi Pico right here. Uh, and here's the Pico debug probe that can be used to flash it. Um, and uh, I have a USB hub tying it all together. And I'm going to try to do it. I'm going to try to. Uh, do two things with the Raspberry Pi Pico. Uh, so the first thing I'd like to do is to just run some host unit tests. OK, let me run some host unit tests. So uh, here I am in the checkout of the uh, Pigweed Sense repo. I'm going to have Bazelisk run some host unit tests for me. Uh, there's going to be some rebuilding, although I, I cheated a little bit and warmed up my cache so that you don't have to wait very long for all the tests to be built and run. OK, so I'm running some unit tests. Um, so nothing particularly fancy about this. Uh, I ran some unit tests uh, on this very laptop from which I'm also giving this presentation. Again, a bold choice. Uh, and, and it worked. You know, the unit tests passed. So nothing, nothing too exciting. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, start a, a test runner proxy. So I'm going to start a real program that uh, is going to uh, flash the tests run by Bazel uh, to uh, to the piece of hardware that I have here connected to my laptop. OK, OK, OK. So let's do it. So now I'm going to run Bazel test again, but I'm going to pass it a little config flag. 
uh, this config RP2040 basically says, oh, the target platform uh, for, for the build should be R the RP2040 platform. So I'm switching only the target platform, but as you remember, the label flags are also part of the target platform now. So I'm also switching a whole bunch of uh, uh, label flags. But the stuff that I'm building, the targets that I'm building and that I'm running are actually exactly the same. So uh, I have a bunch of uh, CC test targets, and now I'm just building them for a different target platform, which is the uh, uh, Pico2 platform that I have here uh, on, the, on the lectern. And now the tests are running. And you'll notice that the tests are running somewhat more slowly than when I ran them on the host. Um, one reason for this is that, of course, they're executing serially. There's no running tests in parallel. Um, but another reason is that I have to flash them one by one. So these tests are being built by Bazel, and then they're flashed one by one onto the uh, PyPico, and then they execute. And then finally, they report the result. And if, if I'm lucky, then they're all going to pass pretty soon. Let's see, we're almost there, we're almost there. Yeah, um, uh, so yeah, like I said, the neat thing about this is that the tests are exactly the same, right? So I have just one set of uh, CC test targets, um, but I can either execute them locally on the, on the host or I can execute them on this uh, piece of embedded hardware. All right, I don't know if I'm patient enough to wait for the last test. Maybe I am, I am, okay. Oh man, it actually failed, whoa. Oh, oh, well, uh, but th this, so this is actually pretty instructive, right? So uh, you might ask, well, why bother executing your tests in different uh, environments? Uh, but, but the reason is sometimes you might get some of them uh, passing in one environment but failing in another. Uh, and so this is what happened here. Although I'm not going to debug it live. This is like ba bad enough as it is. Um, so what I'm going to do now is um, I'll also run a little production application. So the first thing I did was I uh, ran some unit tests, you know, flashed them one by one and ran them on the device. Uh, and now I'm going to uh, flash an actual application that does something, the sense application, onto the, uh, onto the uh, device. And now I'm going to connect to it. All right. Let's connect to the simulated application. I have a little Python console, which of course I also built through Bazel. Uh, uh oh. You refuse my connection. No, no. Oh, I know why, I know why. That's because I need to write the, there we go, perfect, okay. No, no. I'll be, I'll be unhappy today, it's not going to work for me. Very sad, very sad. Yes, yes, this is what you get for doing, uh, uh, doing a live demo. But maybe I can connect to the console on the device with a little bit of luck, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see. Yes, this is the one. Perfect, okay, yeah. So uh, now I've flashed my device and I've connected to, uh, to it from some Python console. Um, you, you cannot see it back from where you're sitting, but there's a little diode that's uh, blinking on this board uh, and also emitting logs in the Python saying that it's blinking on and off. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, I can ask the board for its onboard temperature and it's going to tell me what it is. Um, and the neat thing that I was going to show you but I, I failed to, uh, is that uh, you can then uh, also run the simulated application on your host device. So um, you can run it either on the Pico 2 or on the host device and then connect to either one of them with the same Python console. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, thus test your on-device flows uh, locally. All right, awesome, uh, enough demo, man. Um, uh, yeah, so to recap, this was the modern era example of Pigweed Sense, which, uh, as I said before, I encourage you to check out on the Pigweed website. Um, you can run the same unit tests on device and on host. You can run the same production application on device and on host. And you can use the same console, Python console, for debugging on device and on host. Um, and uh, to recap the whole uh, modern era, um, the basic idea is that we want to liberate ourselves from custom library rules, use just CC library, liberate ourselves from custom transitions, and just use platform-based flags and the generic platform data rule, um, and uh, liberate ourselves from hard-coded hard configuration choices in the build files of uh, third-party libraries like FreeRTOS, and instead use label flags. All right, so that's what uh, we've been up to in the embedded development world so far. Let me say just a few brief words about the future. Um, we firmly believe that Bazel can become recognized as the best build system for embedded development. Uh, and uh, if we think that it's, it's the secret ace in the hall is the external dependencies management story, which for many embedded developers is a, is a particular sore point, keeping the development environment and uh, all of their uh, dependencies up to date when they uh, ramp up on a new project. 
Um, and what we think is really important to get from here to there, uh, and what, where we see great value uh, in, uh, in the near future is doing more work on turnkey code health tools, so making it easier to integrate linting and formatting and other such uh, uh, code health uh, uh, workflows into, into a Bazel first development approach. All right, so that's uh, all I had, and uh, with that, I'm open to questions. Hi. Uh, one thing we do a lot in our build is reset transitions a lot. If I remember correctly, previously you could do something similar with the platform, but when you reset the transitions, the hashes that are part of the build are way different. Do you think if that is kind of like different now? So there's still some, this remains a concern, the fact that like, uh, as you switch between uh, target platforms and as you switch the values of different build flags, right. um, you're going to see invalidation and so you'll be forced to do rebuilds. There's been some work recently that helps with this. For example, there's an experimental flag that prevents Starlark flags from propagating to the exec configuration. So at least between like, the device configuration and the exec configuration, you can stop leakage of the flags, which is going to uh, result in better cache hits. But in general, yeah, this remains a challenge. Thank you. Hi, I saw your tests were Linux sandbox. That must mean your tests are actually written differently to it attach to the remote? Is there a plan in the postmodern era to make those remote execution? Yeah, no, I think that would be great. I think um, uh, I was actually talking to some other attendees at uh, BaselCon about some solutions that they have in this space. And I think, yeah, this is one of the things that we'd like to work on in the new f near future, having first-class first support for remote execution of on-device tests. Yeah, that's uh, But yeah, how, how exactly that would work, I'm not yet sure, but happy to follow up uh, to chat more afterwards. Hi. Oh, oh, is there one more? Sorry. Sorry. So, uh, I had a quick question. Um, so you mentioned uh, sort of third-party remote dependencies as one of the ugliest parts of em embedded development, which is absol absolutely true. But I want to ask about the number one ugliest part of embedded development, which is proprietary closed source tools with license, external license servers and such. Uh, so just in order for Bazel to become the best system the best build system for embedded systems, I think this question needs to have something of an answer. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. This is, it's a difficult area, right? Because the like, details of what to do depend so much on the tool. Um, in our experience so far, the approach we've take, tended to take is uh, have some special machines in CI which have access to the licenses and have them populate the cache and then uh, have other workers just rely on reading from that cache. So sort of get build acceleration entirely through populating the cache from machines that happen to have access to the license. And it's not wholly satisfactory. It's not really a first class solution. But yeah, I agree that this is a, a problem where it would be good to see. Uh, OK, great. Thank work. you. Yeah. Uh, first of all, this is really impressive and cool. Oh, thank you for sharing this. This is awesome. Uh, could you elaborate on the difference on the, how the tests work under the hood? The, the prior person asked a question hinted at this. Like, if you run them on the host, they're actually running the unit tests. But if you run them against the device, they're doing something, like they're communicating over protocol or something like that. What does the implementation of that look like? How is it different? Like, how much, how much does, do the people writing this code have to be aware of the kind of like guts of how like the test rules work? Yeah, so what we do today um, is the, the test binary is actually built to execute on the device, and then there's a, a test runner that executes it that's being run under. So we use the run under flag to invoke a test runner, which is a host Python binary that then flashes that test um, and then waits for an, a response that says whether the test passed or failed and also streams the logs back from it. <coughs> So it's all kind of tra transparent magic stuff that the, the firmware authors don't have to care about. Yeah, that's right. But it's, uh, it's not entirely satisfactory because the uh, w one thing that's not great about it is that the test uh, queue time is on, the, on this like, proxy that we're running under is counted as test execution time by Bazel. And so the, the test timeouts are no longer meaningful. Uh, so I think there's like a better, more, more like, uh, Bazel-aware solution to this problem, but we haven't figured it out just yet. All right, great. Thank you very much, Ted. Another round of applause, please.